The early modern period has been a time of many different kinds of revolutions. We saw a technological revolution with the rise of the printing press, intellectual revolutions or changes in the way that people thought about their world and their place in it, with the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation, the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. And each revolution helped cause the next. Take the enlightenment, for example. In terms of causes, we see ideas from the Renaissance and from Americas laying the foundation for the Enlightenment. Humanist thinkers of the Renaissance laid the groundwork by questioning the authority of the Catholic Church and refocusing their efforts on what humans can do to affect their condition, as opposed to relying on God to direct human activity and heaven as the place that will be better. The power and wealth generated by the Columbian Exchange had two primary effects. It increased the power of government of Europe, creating a powerful new form of monarchy, absolute monarchy. And also Europeans began to compare themselves and their societies to the civilizations and societies of Americas, leading to more curiosity about the world. At the same time, the scientific revolution changed how people think about the world. It was assumed that through reason and science, people could understand nature and harmonize with its laws, thus progressing towards happiness and perfection. The scientific revolution gave people a process by which to think things through, and the result was a dramatically different way of looking at the world for educated people. When the 17th century opened, serious scientists might still believe in witches. When the 17th century closed, this would have been impossible. Superstition was on the outs, and the most important thing was that the scientific method became the way to figure anything out even social and political problems, as the Enlightenment showed us. To review, the Enlightenment was an 18th century intellectual movement that aimed to improve society by replacing divine right as the basis of government with a new form of legitimacy called the social contract, establishing the ideal form of government as one that protects people's natural rights. Major Enlightenment figures include Locke, Voltaire, Rousseau, Montesquieu, Hobbes, and as we'll learn later in the next unit, Adam Smith. These thinkers engaged with ideas about democratic governance, human rights, and political liberty, and proposed alternatives to absolute monarchy as a form of government. As we saw, Thomas Hobbes wrote during a time of civil war in England, just after King Charles I had been executed. He believed that human nature was selfish, that people on their own would compete to survive, and that would cause chaos. His ideal form of government was absolute monarchy based on the legitimacy of just having enough power to hold the crown. Then came John Locke, who thought that people were actually mostly good and reasonable. He thought that they had a natural right to life, liberty, and property, and that people enter into a social contract with the government to protect those rights. His ideal form of government was representative, styled after England's parliamentary monarchy. Rousseau, by contrast, thought that most people were naturally good and that society and private property corrupts them. He believed that government should express the general will and advocated for direct democracy. Montesquieu believed that power corrupts people and that government should have a separation of powers with checks and balances to prevent any one branch from getting too powerful. And Voltaire, my favorite, advocated for toleration and free speech as rights that the government should respect. These ideas were all about politics, and they were all fundamentally about changing the way that politics worked and government worked. And over time, eventually, they would have exactly that effect. In terms of concrete political revolutions, so big changes in government achieved through violent uprisings. As an effect of the Enlightenment, we see major, major changes in the world that continue to have echoes and consequences, starting with the American Revolution, followed by the French Revolution, followed by the Haitian Revolution and Latin American independence movements. Even long after the time period that we're studying, the early modern period, the precedent set by the American and French revolutions continue to inspire people to fight for their freedom and fight for their rights. To understand these revolutions, we have to remember the political context that the Enlightenment played out in. 
there were absolute monarchs in Spain, France, Austria, and Russia who claimed that they had the right to rule based on divine right theory, this idea that God gives the king and his family unique power to rule over their states, and in turn, the king is answerable to God alone, not to his people. England had a slightly different system. It had a parliamentary monarchy with a king whose power was checked by a parliament, which is kind of like our Senate and House of Representatives in the United States. In the English colonies, in the Americas, settlers, white settlers, enjoyed some, but not all of the rights that Englishmen would have enjoyed at home. And there we're gonna find the seeds of the American Revolution. Mercantilism, meanwhile, was the economic system of the day, and it was based on basically extracting wealth from the colonies to make the mother country at home rich. It was based on the idea that a country's wealth depended on how much gold and silver it possessed and by regulating trade with their colonies. There are several ideas of the Enlightenment that really had an effect on the way that people understood government and on the way that people began to understand their rights. And these ideas have inspired revolutions worldwide ever since, especially this idea that political legitimacy comes from the consent of the governed in a social contract, not divine right, but also an idea that people are born equal with natural rights. These are ideas that are so commonplace, we really have to think kind of hard to understand why they were so important to begin with. But in the time period where you had a king who was supposed to be born with a divine right to rule, so not equal to everybody else, um, and society structured with a nobility or an upper class that also set itself apart from the masses, this idea that everybody, king and peasant alike, were born equal was pretty revolutionary. Natural rights also were a novel idea. And locks, the natural right to life, liberty, and property would prove especially influential, as would Locke's idea of the social contract, where people give up some individual rights to get the protection of government, and in turn, government protects people's natural rights, and the people have the right to alter or abolish a government that fails to do this. Similarly, Locke's ideal form of government, representative democracy, like in ancient Rome, the Republic, um, would prove to be really influential in political revolutions moving forward. Rousseau's idea of the general will also proved pretty influential, this idea that government should reflect what the people generally want, and that it should strive to protect people's equality and their freedom. Rousseau's ideal form of government, direct democracy, also proved influential, also proved very difficult to put into place. Voltaire's notions that people should be able to have freedom of speech and practice the religion they want without worrying about being burned alive for it or thrown in jail also is part and parcel of these ideas that revolutionaries would later pick up on and fight for and put into place in their founding documents. And then finally, Montesquieu's ideas that separation of powers and checks and balances are important. You can't give one person full power over a country and expect it to go well. That will prove really influential in these revolutions to come. So broadly, as an effect of this time period that we call the Enlightenment, which is characterized basically by questioning established traditions and authority, a lot of ideas began to gradually change. First, faith to logic, this idea that the guiding principle of politics and philosophy changed from being based on religious faith to being based on something a bit more reasonable like social contract theory. Second, the idea of natural or human rights began to be discussed in a way that was completely new and revolutionary. Philosophers decided that all people had basic rights, not just the upper class. This included people who settled in the colonies, which at the time were treated as slightly lesser than um, you know, people from back home in Europe. It bears repeating here that they kind of forget about non-white, non-male people having rights here too. So that's like a part of the Enlightenment tradition that we as a society have aimed to perfect over hundreds of years since this time period. At the time, they didn't think too much about women or anybody who wasn't a white European basically as falling into this category for various reasons. <laughs> 
Third, government. Political thinkers brought back the idea from ancient Greece and ancient Rome that people should have a say in their government and thought the social contract made a lot more sense than divine right as a source of legitimacy for power. All of these ideas ended up contributing as causes to several concrete violent political events, revolutions and independence movements in the United States and France and Haiti worldwide in the hundreds of years since that attempted to change the social and political order to something more enlightened. And so these are our key points to the day, but if you're pausing the slide here to get these down, please click play again so I can walk you through a couple of these revolutions and founding documents as examples. But generally, Today we're focusing on how and to what extent the Enlightenment was a contributing cause to political revolutions. So first a definition. Political revolutions involve a usually violent overthrow of the existing government to put into place a different system of government or different rulers. Revolutions and most wars, most events really, have both economic or material causes and ideological causes, causes based on ideas. And it's useful to separate the two when we're thinking about how political events happen. Here, the revolutionaries used the language of the Enlightenment to justify their actions and to guide their creations of new governing structures. However, the political revolutions themselves were sparked by more material concerns in the short term, including taxation systems that were deemed to be unfair. So to be clear, and as a review from earlier lessons, Material causes relate to reasons linked to tangible, usually economic needs or grievances. Usually this would be the reason that a revolution happens when it does, or the spark that prompts people to put their ideological reasons to revolt into action. In the American Revolution, for example, it was taxation and not having a say in parliament. In the French Revolution, it was famine, like fear of starvation and massive inequality, coupled with a king not seeming to care or to be able to fix it. The Haitian Revolution was sparked by the continued and brutal practice of slavery in a French colony after the French Revolution. And then Latin American independence movements were sparked by the grievances of the settlers in Latin America and the way that they were being treated by the crown in Spain. Usually, I would say always, but I don't like absolutist statements. So usually you need both material and ideological reasons to motivate people for any short of violent endeavor. Like people don't tend to act or put themselves at great risk of violence just because a nice idea makes it seem like it's important. Usually they need like a threat to their pocketbook or to their, their next meal in order to like really get to that point. Usually people who do violent things though, only I advertise their ideological motivations. So it's important to pay attention to both because you have to read through the lines to, in terms of like why people say they do things. Ideological causes tend to supply the moral justification for any action. They're ideas tied to values and morals that make actions seem good, right, and even necessary, creating a permission structure to take action. And in terms of these political revolutions, the Enlightenment and its ideas provided this moral justification. Specifically, the idea that if a government is not upholding its end of the social contract, if it's failing to protect people and property and life, it's not meeting the needs of its people. And so those people have the right and the obligation to have a revolution and install a government that will protect their rights. The idea of natural rights here were super influential. It wasn't commonly thought before the Enlightenment that people had rights. As these ideas took root and as people began to absorb this notion that humans have rights, it became almost necessary seeming to fight for them. And then finally, this idea of government by consent of the governed, this idea that people should have a say in the way that they are governed and that the government gets its power from the people, not from this like divine right theory that they'd had kicking around for a while. 
So go ahead and pause this slide here, get all of these notes in your notebook, and then press play again so I can show you concretely how this worked in a couple revolutions. The American Revolution was the first one to go, and it began as a colonial revolt against Great Britain, prompted by the upper class colonists belief that England was not respecting their rights, specifically surrounding unfair taxation and not having representation in Parliament. There were longer term causes, for example, the Seven Years War, also known as the French and Indian War, which was fought for the colonists benefit, was super costly. And so that increased taxation for the colonists to pay for it. The colonists didn't like that because they didn't have representation in Parliament and Parliament was the body that decided the tax issue. So they felt that was unfair and they felt that it was unfair because Enlightenment ideas told them that it was unfair. Um, Enlightenment ideas justified being upset about this increase in taxation without having enough representation in Parliament. And those Enlightenment ideas had been spreading through the colonies, specifically after Paine wrote a pamphlet called Common Sense, and that was distributed around that argued for these ideas. In addition, France and England hated each other, always had, and France, never one to miss a chance to kind of thumb its nose at England, provided the colonists with military assistance that they would have needed for a successful rebellion. These revolts became a war of independence from England, which the colonists would win, resulting in the founding of a new republic, the United States, that derived political legitimacy from Enlightenment principles. This was revolutionary. This had not happened before. However, the same republic preserved the existing power structure of the colonies essentially intact, so the social hierarchy didn't change at all as a result making this somewhat of a conservative revolution. It can thus be seen as more of a political revolution than a social revolution, meaning it changed the system of government, and that is a huge deal, but it did not change the social hierarchy. White propertied males were still at the top, women um, and anybody who wasn't white was towards the bottom, or you know, not even in the hierarchy, often sometimes not even considered a full human. We can see the influence of the Enlightenment super clearly in the founding documents of this revolution. Take, for example, the Declaration of Independence of 1776, which is the document in which the revolutionaries stated their, their goals of the revolution, like why they're having it. Go ahead and pause the slide and try to find Locke's ideas of natural rights, the social contract, see if you can figure out who's which philosopher's version it is, and where legitimacy is specified in this document. Also, think of one fact that proves that the founders didn't fully follow through on these Enlightenment ideas. Pause here and then I'll explain in the next slide. So, the Declaration of Independence, incredibly important founding document that sets out the goals of the revolution. And it reads, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. In other words, when things happen that make it necessary for my group of people with shared interests to declare that we will no longer be ruled by your group of people with different interests and instead form an independent and equal state, which the laws of nature totally give us the right to do. We recognize that we need to clearly explain why we're having a political revolution and declaring independence. Here you can see the goal, dissolving the political bands, so independence from a colonizer. And we can see natural law, the laws of nature already in that first paragraph. It continues. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In other words, we can't believe this still needs to be said. This should be obvious to everybody, but number one, all men are born equal with natural rights, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And this comes straight from John Locke. Second, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men 
deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. In other words, governments exist to secure these natural rights. This is classic social contract theory. Last paragraph, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. In other words, three, the legitimacy of governments, the right to rule, comes from the consent of the governed, we the people, democracy. Four, when governments fail to protect people's natural rights to life liberty, for example, they lose the right to govern. This is John Locke's social contract theory again. And in these cases, the people have the right to change or overthrow the government and replace it with one that can better protect their natural rights. Again, John Locke all over this document. The declaration continues. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the, form, abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. In other words, clearly people shouldn't go around overthrowing long-standing governments for just any small reason, but history shows that people don't tend to do that. Revolutions are rare and people tend to put up with a surprising amount of abuse before they even consider rising up against a tyrannical but familiar government. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. In other words, when a government repeatedly violates people's natural rights and rules them illegitimately, then the people not only have the right, but also an obligation to throw, overthrow that government and create a new system to protect their interests and security. This is John Locke's social contract theory again. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. In other words, the situation we just described is what these colonies have been dealing with from England and its stupid king, who we don't like, and this is what is causing us to have to change our system of government. Okay, this is just the first bit of the Declaration of Independence, but already you can see how Enlightenment philosophy has been used to justify this big political event, separating the colonies from England. As a result of this revolution, we have the Constitution of the United States, a document also infused with Enlightenment ideas that provides the basis for law to this day. The first 10 amendments to the Constitution are called the Bill of Rights, and that's where we start listing some natural rights of people in the United States that the government must respect and protect. And you can see Enlightenment philosophy all over them, especially in the First Amendment, where you'll see our little buddy Voltaire. It says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, so toleration, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So people have the right to practice their religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and to protest. Notably, this amendment protects people from being thrown into prison for things that they say. So freedom of speech means the government will not arrest you for what you say. It does not mean that there are no social consequences for being a terrible person. Um, so if you say like horrible things, you can expect society to not be nice to you and that doesn't trample your freedom of speech rights. Um, similarly, the freedom to protest is one that is important because it has been under threat in recent history with the tear gassing of peaceful protesters uh, that goes completely against the First Amendment. There's the Second Amendment, we're pretty familiar with it, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. 
Notably, the Second Amendment was written to preserve the institution of slavery and to, to appease the southern colonies in that the United States wasn't going to take away their ability to keep slaves by force. So when you hear debates about the Second Amendment, keep that ugly history in mind. There are additional amendments, I'm not going to read them all out to you, but they protect people's rights against being arrested for no reason. Um, the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, like you can't be forced to testify yourself. Think about that one in terms of the history of torture that preceded it, right? Like before people could be tortured and like attempted to be made to confess to crimes that they may or may not have committed. The Fifth Amendment protects people from that. So if you want to pause the slide here, have a look at just the first six of the first 10 amendments of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. This revolution has a pretty mixed legacy, right? It was incredibly impactful. It was revolutionary in the sense that it set the precedent for the idea that a nation could establish itself on principles rather than traditional structures. In other words, we can build a nation based on ideas and values. And those ideas and values in this case came from the Enlightenment. Also, European powers learned that they could potentially lose their colonies, also revolutionary. And the actual ideas enshrined in the founding documents proved to be revolutionary over the long term in that even though these rights were not extended to non-white men or women at the time, um, in the years since then, we have built towards or grown towards that goal. Influence of the Enlightenment can be seen then in the Declaration of Independence, especially John Locke's ideas about social contract, um, and just the fact that this is a democracy, so Rousseau's idea of the general will is playing a part here. Um, our Constitution establishes three separate branches of government, which reflects Montesquieu's ideas of a separation of powers, and our Bill of Rights starts to define protections for natural rights, including Voltaire's ideas about freedom, expression, and tolerance. However, this wasn't a complete revolution, right? Parts of this that were not so revolutionary was that only white men of property counted as equal citizens with full rights. And that's hugely problematic. A few years after the American Revolution, and partly as a result of the American Revolution, came the French Revolution of 1789, a fascinating event that deserves a lot more attention than the few minutes that we have to give it today. The French Revolution describes a revolution in which the people of France overthrew their absolute monarch, who at the time was King Louis XVI, and proclaimed equality to be a universal right, attempted to rationalize society and make France a republic. It had complex long-term causes. As simply as possible, it was caused by an absolute monarch who was widely thought to be completely out of touch with the needs of his people, who proved it. But the taxation system in which the segment of society, the middle and lower classes that did all of the work, paid all of the taxes and had the least amount of money. Fear of starving because of a bad harvest, and a middle class that had heard of Enlightenment ideas and had followed the American Revolution with interest and wanted to institute a government along the same lines. This was the social as well as a political revolution in that revolutionaries aimed to rework the fundamental structures of society and in so doing change the political framework of France as well. Social then meant they wanted to change the social hierarchy. They wanted to get rid of the titles of nobility that separated um, French society into different classes unfairly and political in that they wanted to change the form of government. First to a constitutional monarchy, but then the king made it clear that there would be no social revolution as long as he was in power. Then the king tried to run away and then they found him in dramatic uh, fashion. Great story you should read about called When the King Took Flight and uh, then off with his head. The French Revolution was important worldwide because the revolutionaries deliberately attempted to spread the idea that society should be organized along more rational lines and that the rights it promoted were the rights of everyone, regardless of where they were in the world. This is referred to as universal rights. <laughs> 
However, the revolutionaries were unable to implement a governing structure as stable as the one that resulted from the American Revolution. During the revolution, France became a constitutional monarchy, a radical republic, an empire with an emperor, and finally a constitutional monarchy again, and then an empire again. And then almost a century later, it became a republic along the lines initially envisioned by the revolutionary leaders. So, like I said, complex event, but fascinating and absolutely worth studying. The main document that came out of the French Revolution is called the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And here we have a selection, just so you can see how enlightenment ideas played into these two. First, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be founded only upon the general good. Two, the aim of all political association is the preservation of the natural rights of men. So government exists to protect natural rights. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Third, the principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. Fourth, liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. Hence, the exercise of the natural rights of each man has no limits except those which assure to the other members of the society the enjoyment of the same rights. These limits can only be determined by law. So in other words, you have the right to do whatever you want until it starts to infringe on someone else's natural rights. Five, law can only prohibit such actions as are hurtful to society. Nothing may be prevented which is not forbidden by law, and no one may be forced to do anything not provided for by law. Then we're skipping a few clearly here, right? Ten, no one shall be disquieted on account of his opinions, including his religious views, provided their manifestation does not disturb the public order established by law. Eleven, the free communication of ideas and opinions is one of the most precious of the rights of man. Every citizen may, accordingly, speak, write, and print with freedom, but shall be responsible for such abuses of this freedom as shall be defined by law. So here we have a mix of several different Enlightenment philosophers. You can clearly see Voltaire and Rousseau and even John Locke's ideas about the purpose of government. And this document has been not only an inspiration to the revolutionaries who fought in France, but to revolutionaries the world over, and generally to human rights law. Together, these two revolutions, the American Revolution and the French Revolution, provided the world with models for how to revolt against a colonial power or a tyrannical government. And the language and founding documents of both revolutions have reappeared in so many uprisings and political revolutions and independence movements in the years since, along with establishing the basics of human rights in law in the short term, these revolutions led directly to the Haitian Revolution and Latin American independence movements. But in the long term, they have served as the inspiration and blueprint for revolutions worldwide, not just in the early modern period, but in modern history and even in contemporary times as well.